Welcome to the CEC Report. It's the 1st of April and I'm Robert Barwick. Today's is a special edition of the CEC Report because today we're going to be talking to an international guest of the Citizens Electoral Council from South Africa, Philip Sokolabane. Welcome, Philip. Welcome. All right. The reason Philip is joining us is because he has just attended a conference that the CEC held here in Melbourne on this past weekend, the 28th and 29th of March. And the title of the conference was The World Land Bridge, Peace on Earth, Goodwill Towards All Men. And the subject of the conference based on that title was what is something the CEC has been campaigning for for quite a while now and, and regular viewers of this show will recognise it. It's the new economic and financial architecture that is possible for the world on the back of this new formation that has come into being the last few years called the BRICS. The, the five countries of Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa who have formed an alliance which is not geographic because look at them on the map, they're all spread out from each other and it's not based on current uh, you know, ties between the countries. The alliance is based on a shared commitment to economic development and this offers a lot of promise. Now the CEC has put out pamphlets on this and the last New Citizen we put out had a headline that basically said Australia and the UK should join this BRICS process. Not formally, the BRICS is a, is a formal body, but in spirit and in collaboration. That if countries can actually um, collaborate around economic development together, we can both get the world out of the economic breakdown crisis that it is in, which is condemning you know, billions of people around the world to poverty and early death, we can finally get out of that and we can have a basis for a lasting peace. And that was the subject of this conference. So we had guest speakers at this conference from Russia and we had Philip representing South Africa, two of the BRICS countries. We had other international guest speakers via video link from the United States discussing various economic and security aspects of this process. And we had a very special guest speaker from the Ukraine via video link, Natalia Vetrenko, describing what the Ukraine is like now as probably the, the leading victim in the world of the, um, the antithesis of the BRICS process, which is the Anglo-Americans um, representing the city of London and Wall Street in a desperate attempt to keep their financial power over the world being prepared to go to war and pick, and, and pick a war with BRICS countries such as Russia and China in order to preserve their financial dominance. Right? So that was a very powerful presentation as well. These presentations are up on the CEC's website and on the CEC's YouTube account and people can watch those. But in future weeks we're going to be running excerpts of some of these presentations that, and Australians should really watch them. Now it just so happened that while our conference was on there was some concrete progress on one aspect of this process that the BRICS um, countries have uh, set off, which is the uh, question of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank that China has announced in the last few years, which is it has invited all countries to join. And people would know there's been a rush of countries in recent times. And the, the rush has been so stark that it's really shown up Australia as being you know, in this region, the biggest foot drag, and of course everyone knows this because the United States pressured us and South Korea and Japan that, you know, we shouldn't join. Well, anyway, the purpose of this bank is to uh, uh, invest in the infrastructure that's going to underpin the world standard of living, in, or, or, or the standard of living in Asia, but that's going to have an impact for the world. And China wants to collaborate around that. And this is, this is a, a BRICS-style proposal. Right, and that's why we're, we're very supportive of Australia joining it. So um, as our conference was on, on the, on the Saturday first, on the 28th, the news came through that Russia, which is, people may not realise this, Russia is a big Asian power, half of Russia is in Asia. Russia announced that it will be joining the Asian Infrastructure Bank. And then the next day, finally, the Prime Minister issued a press, the Prime Minister of Australia issued a press conference uh, release saying Australia has signed a memorandum of understanding with a view that we too will seek to join the AIIB as founding members. And this was very good news. However, it's, it's 
it's trying to have a little bit the best of both, you know, a little of both ways because we're still playing coy. We actually haven't com fully committed to joining it yet. We want to use our position to leverage the negotiations on questions of governance issues and I'm sure to be sort of a bit of a mole for the United States and, and um, country, other countries on this. But the, the general direction is a good one and we very much applaud that and this is the kind of thing our conference was about trying to push forward that perspective because if we don't get these kind of changes in, in the world dynamic and the world order, then we are heading really rapidly into a thermonuclear war which will destroy us all. So, well, that's by way of introduction. So now, for the sake of Australian audience, let me turn to our special guest from South Africa, Philip, who represents a country which is a member of the BRICS, right? Yeah. And, of course, um, I would suspect, Philip, outside of cricket, unfortunately, <laughs> Uh, Australia would not know a huge amount about South Africa, uh, and, and I shouldn't I shouldn't be that um, uh, trite. Also, you know, Australians would know about Nelson Mandela, and you know, have a, and have a lot of respect for that. But there's a South Africa is a major economy, right? It's a major power in Africa, and it is conspicuously one of these BRICS countries. So let me ask you first. Why is South Africa a member of the BRICS? What does South Africa see in this process? Yes, uh, <coughs> part of that uh, can be, of your question can be, what can South Africa offer the BRICS? We started as BRIC, then apparently South Africa was approached to be a member of BRIC, turning into, into BRICS, simply because South Africa has a fully set economy on the African continent. We have the capability and the power to develop the whole continent of Africa. We have the machine tool principle, meaning that we are capable, we have uh, iron ore, we can be able to turn that into ma machines yep. that can be used to develop the whole of Africa. So South Africa thought it it's capable of being self-sufficient and could do Africa, go develop Africa alone yes. almost. Yes, almost yeah. we can do that. Yeah. It's maybe something that the, South, the present government might not be aware of, but coming out of uh, apartheid, looking at the, what the Boers were able to do, you can see that South Africa does have the capability. We are the only country on the African continent that has nuclear energy. So that shows, to an yep. extent, what we are capable of. Yep. That's why we are opposed to join BRICS. And we are happy to be in BRICS because uh, there will be projects coming on simply because we'll be able to tap into the new development bank for infrastructure purposes that will be beneficial to South Africa, be beneficial to the whole continent. And if we don't do that for Africa, then Africa will be doomed. At present, many people are flocking into South Africa, refugees, economic refugees from Africa, simply because their countries have nothing, absolutely nothing. So they see South Africa as a small haven. So if we can develop their countries, develop African countries, that will stop them coming over to South Africa and creating problems between them and the locals. And Phil, the key word here is develop, because if I can draw a, con a comparison, I, I can remember when Bill Clinton was president and he and Al Gore used to talk about providing the internet for Africa. But of course, when you say development, you mean something much more substantial than that. Yes. <laughs> Maybe to some people, uh, internet means development, but to, to Africa, it's, it's not development. Uh, when President Obama was in Africa in 2013, he promised energy. The energy that he's talking about is li two li light bulbs in a room because we've got to go solo, solar, and wind mean. We can't go wind. We have to go nuclear. Yep. And especially at this moment in time, we should already be in fusion. 
fusion power. Yes. We thought, yeah. So we do not need development called internet. Exactly. Yes, that's not development. And there's already we actually in our, on our show last week we, we put these pictures up. We can you do them again, but with with South Africa in through the BRICS being part of the pr the grouping that includes China, you've already got some pretty major development underway in African countries financed by China in the form of real development, major water projects and major transportation projects, etc. And that is that has to be the standard of the development you're talking about. Yes. Uh, you can talk about uh, things like uh, uh, the development corridors. These development corridors that are envisaged that because of the BRICS or because of the new development bank will be able to be carried out. Because uh, project, big projects were talked about in the past. But when it came to the question of finance, <laughs> you all, always had to go to the IMF, the World Banks of this world, and they will always say, no, there's no money. Or they will promise you that, no, there will be money. But eventually, all those programs, good projects, big projects, never took off on, from the ground. They never saw the light of day, may, most of them. Well, so with the BRICS, we are really sure that we are moving away from that. President, president Jacob Zuma, the president of South Africa, stated that with the new development bank, if you come for a loan, ask him for a loan, he won't leave empty-handed. And that's, that's a very important uh, undertaking because the development is needed. You can't yes. afford to leave empty-handed. Let's take a break. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I want, to, I want you to talk about the South African economy and okay. why this development is so necessary. Welcome back to the CEC Report, where I'm talking with our guest from South Africa, Philip Sokolabane, on the need for economic development in Africa and why Africa is a member of the BRICS group of nations. Now, Philip, so we've, we've discussed this economic development question, but can you give Australians a sense of what the South African economy is like, especially for poor people, poor black people, and therefore why there is a thirst for economic development? Yes, uh, we were colonised just like uh, Australia by the British. We were taken over by the Afrikaners under apartheid. Well, the Africaners saw the country as their fatherland, but in doing that, they developed themselves, yep. not the black man. The black man was always down under. It was, they stepped on him so that they didn't give us expertise. We are just labor. Yep. Yes, yep. just common labor. So the technicalities were only known to them. We were denied opportunities to go to school. That's why in 1976, they decided that we should be taught in Afrikaans, a language that we didn't understand. All subjects were to be done in Afrikaans. So that's how they were denying us yeah. the knowledge. So coming out of that, it means that the black man or the black person in South Africa is backward economically. So this government of the National Afri African National Congress has to develop or take blacks to the level where the whites are. Well, it's not easy. It's not easy because the whites are not happy with that and mm -hmm. they would not be happy. So somewhere the things have to be forced. But we are getting there. We've got we, a hope or belief. Just as you, see, you have seen how our former late president, Pre President Mandela, took us out of bad condition, of conditions where people thought that there would be bloodshed. Yep. So we hope that even after he has gone with President Zuma or the coming 
governments that might come of the black people. We will progress. We will reach for the stars. We too want to go to the moon, not just as passengers. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Yes. And that, that, that's an exa that aspiration is an example to everybody because, you know, in Western countries, we're supposed to be cynical about that kind of thing now, right? That, oh, that's not that important anymore, but of course it very much is. So in terms of the steps of going to the moon, you look at the development question of South Africa, but not just as South Africa, but the whole of Africa. So a in our conference, when you gave a presentation, you specified three areas of development that are a priority. So I'd just like you to go through those. And the first one was a question of an integrated transport um, infrastructure for the continent. Yes, uh, <coughs> we do need such a project. But this is not something new. Uh, right from when, in the 60s, when the African continent or African countries were getting independence, there, were, there was that sense of uh, reaching out to the whole of the continent. Yep. So it's nothing new, but at the present moment, because of the BRICS, we see that we can be in a position to realize that dream where we've got to have a rail, maybe not in the spirit of John Cecil Rose <laughs> when no, he went no, no. to Cape to Cairo, but we need something that will be developmental. Rose needed something to go to be able to take the minerals and to, the ports, to yeah. the ports and all that. But what we need to do is to have rail, for an example, rail system coming from Cape Town up to Cairo with development corridors along the way. Not just rail, but even roads, roads yep. good infrastructure roads with development projects along the way so that people will give, create jobs. Jobs will be created along the way. So that's how we envisage doing yeah, yep, this. Yep. And, and the, the key vision, as you said, Cecil Rhodes was the first to put it, but he, that was a mining driven idea. And in fact, we could probably find a graphic that sh can show you the old African map where the rails were exclusively from the mines to the ports yes. and there was no internal development. So that has to change. But it's this idea of a Cape to Cairo, as you said, and if, they, if you can build around that, then it opens up all kinds of opportunities. And you I think Franklin Roosevelt this is the kind of thing that when he was president and got to visit Africa, he also shared this, this type of, that, that Africa could have this vision for yes. itself. He wanted to have a stop on this thing of uh, colonialism. He, he, saw to, he wanted to not to have only political power for the African even economic power. E economic power. If, you don't give, if you only give them political power, like they are doing throughout the world or throughout uh, Africa, then the Africans won't develop. Yep. And, and the, as recent history has shown, they yes. haven't de they've been decolonized but no development. Let's take another quick break and then we'll come back for their final segment. <laughs> Welcome back to the CEC Report, where I'm discussing South Africa and African development with my special guest, Philip Sokolabani. So, Philip, we were talking about the three development perspectives, and the third one you mentioned at our conference was nuclear power. Nuclear power. Yes, South Africa is the only country at present in Africa, on the African continent, that has nuclear power. And what you expressed before is you're not satisfied with the... The, the West is basically saying, yeah, you can have power, but it's got to be solar power, and that doesn't cut it. No, because you can't run power plants, big power plants, yep. with solar. Yep. It's impossible. They know. Yep. That's why they do have nuclear power plants running their manufacturing plants. But they want us not to have that. It yeah, they have the nuclear power plants, yes. you don't. Yeah. But Africa got it's it. It's just like uh, Zeus with Prometheus. Yes. It's purely that. So they want us uh, to be, it's purely apartheid 
It's economic apartheid. Yes, as he economic said, yeah. apartheid. That if we, do not, we are not qualified to handle uh, science. <laughs> <laughs> if you can suppress technology, you keep the people under yes. control. So we are yearning for that. We want uh, more nuclear power plants. At present, we are talking with uh, various countries. Uh, the process of uh, appointing a country that's going to supply us with about 9,600 megawatts. Bro. It's on the ball. We, yeah, yeah. we are supposed to have finished with Canada, I think, and uh, Japan at the end of m March. Then the process would go along. But uh, to me, I would prefer the Russians because they are coming up with a better uh, model for us. They yep. can build the power plants without uh, us putting in capital. Then yeah, 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 yeah. we'll yep. pay along the way when the plants are already working. And it's the type of the, the new BRICS, the new development bank is yes, perfect Yes, the, new, the new development bank will be good for this. Yep. And even a country like Egypt wants to go nuclear. They haven't gone nuclear yet. But the indications are that they want about 1,800 megawatts of nuclear. Well, look, just thank you for that. In the time we've got left, I will have one last question for you. How is, you, you have, you're from a disadvantaged background in a disadvantaged continent. Yes. How, why did you join the international movement led by Lyndon LaRouche? <laughs> Simply because I'm a human being. You're a human There's being. This love. Yeah. Yeah. Imago Viva Day. Let us make many in our own image. That's yeah. what propels me. Love. The Confucius in me propels yeah. me to go beyond poverty and all that. Because if I give myself into poverty, then uh, I wouldn't have lived. Yes. That's why if you come to my funeral, I'll be darker than this. Yes. Because I wouldn't have completed my mission. So the question of poverty and hunger has nothing to do with being a human being. And if we had time, I would just go to the Jesus parable that the devil went to him when he was fasting for 30 days. He yeah. said, I'll give you everything. Bow to me. Be my servant. He said, no. It's not only through bread that man lives. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not through bread. That I can live. That's that that is that's more than an aspiration. That's that's quite profound. And of course, that that is the philosophy that unites this movement around the world that yes. the CEC is part of. It is all about what does it mean to be a human being. Yes. Um, as people in Western countries do not get the hunger experience that can put it in that context. But even that, what you're saying is, it's not the hunger that drives you. It's the desire to be a human being. To be a human being must always understand that you are a human being. You are not an animal. Even if they can try to turn you into an animal, you are not an animal. You are created in God's image. Well, Philip, thank you very much for joining us today on the CEC Report. Thanks. Um, like I said, Philip was a guest at our conference that we held on the weekend. So all the you can look for Philip's presentation and all the presentations from that conference on our CEC page and on our YouTube account. So I urge you to go and do that. And as f for now, that's it for this week's edition of the CEC Report. Thanks again to Philip. Thanks, Thanks. for tuning in. Tune in Thanks next week Thanks, everybody. For more.